morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service brought to you from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of York. I am Steve Snell, and I will be helping to lead our service today. I have been a member of this congregation for 34 years. The challenge of this faith and the love of this congregation keeps me coming back. Our mission here at UUCY is to be a transformational faith community that serves the religious and spiritual needs of a wide and diverse group of people, a community that earns recognition as a leader in the work of social justice and guides our children to become engaged global citizens. As is customary whenever Unitarian Universalists gather together, we begin by lighting a candle in our chalice. Our candle flame represents the flaming chalice that is a symbol of our living tradition of our faith. We also invite everyone at home to light a candle and as we share our chalice lighting words. Our chalice lighting words today are by Erica Hewitt. The chalice, as a symbol of Unitarian Universalism, arose as a beacon of hope in an atmosphere of tyranny. The chalice arose as a sign of promise that the marginalized would neither be forgotten nor ignored because they are beloved and precious from the perspective of the holy. This morning we remember all the people who have been told explicitly or implicitly through police violence or governmental policy, through derision or de dehumanization, that they are anything less than whole, anything less than beloved. As we each light a candle in our homes, may we make of our lives a beacon, a symbol of our promise to draw the circle wide, a sign that we will not rest until all means all. Our opening words today come from Eugene Debs in his infamous Canton, Ohio anti-war speech given in 1918. It is the minorities who have made the history of this world. It is the few who have had the courage to take their places at the front, who have been true enough to themselves to speak the truth that was in them, who have dared to oppose the established order of things, who have espoused the cause of the suffering, struggling poor, who have upheld without regard to personal consequences the cause of freedom and righteousness. It is they, the heroic, self-sacrificing few, who have made the history of the race and who have paved the way from barbarism to civilization. The many prefer to remain upon the popular side. They lack the courage and vision to join a despised minority that stands for a principle. They have not the moral fiber that withstands endures, and finally conquers. They are to be pitied and not treated with contempt, for they cannot help their cowardice. But thank God, in every age and in every nation, there have been the brave and self-reliant few, and they have been sufficient to their historic task. And we who are here today are under infinite obligations to them because they suffered, they sacrificed, they went to jail, they had their bones broken upon the wheel. They were burned at the stake and their ashes scattered to the winds by the hands of hate and revenge in their struggle to leave the world better for us than they found it for themselves. The war against us all. This war in this Iraq, war in Iraq, Iraq isn't the end. It's the beginning. Wars to come. All around the world. All around the world. 
of the needle of the needle of the needle in the White House. This is the this is the Bush come to life. Come to life. War, war, and war, and more war. War brought to you by the Big Five, the Big Corporate Monsters who run the show. This isn't just this isn't just a war on Iraq or Afghanistan or even Arabs or Muslims. It is ultimately it is ultimately on a war on us all. That's because that's because billions and billions of dollars that are being spent on this war. The cost of rockets, rockets, bullets, and yes, even thousands, plus troops. Is money that will never be spent on education, on health care, on on the reconstruction of the crumbling public house, or to train and place what millions of were lost, many lost, many jobs in jobs in the past three years alone. The war in the war in Iraq is in reality a war against the nation's workforce and the poor. We're getting less and less of the big defense industries are making it literally, literally. What's next? What's next? Iran, Iran, Syria, Syria, North Korea, North Korea Venezuela. Venezuela. We've already We've seen, already the, corporate seen the corporate media play megaphone to, to the White House to build and to promote, build and promote a, war a war based on lies. War, war, war is used by the lies by the imperialists and foreigners and to crush internal, internal enemies. We're seeing the truth. We're the truth. Of the insight. When we see the Saracenage of American education, the rush of 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 the Canadians because American drugs are just too expensive threatening the threatening privatization of social security and the way and the way of repression, repression, that repression that comes with an increasing with an militarized, militarized, police. militarized police. This is a war, this is a war on all of them. And the struggle, and the struggle is between war is real. For a struggle life. for a better life. For the millions of folks, millions of folks who are in, in, this in this country. The fight against the, the, fight against the war is, is real. For your fight for your own interest. Not for false, not for false the defense of the defense of the corporate or the corporate or the or the White House. Down, down, with the war for empire. From death row, from death row. This is Lumia Abu. Your mom. The Vietnam War was transformative, transformative for me, not because I was sent there as many of my friends were, but it meant the evolution of a conservative kid. I was raised in the 1950s and 60s in a very Lutheran, fairly conservative middle-class family. My father, a veteran of World War II, and I eventually went to a small, rural, Lutheran-affiliated college in Pennsylvania. But in the late 1960s, the anti-war movement even came to Susquehanna University. And I was in the thick of it. I recognized, from my perspective, the vestiges of French colonialism that we attempted to prop up, and some very anti-democratic tendencies when we thought that our side would lose in an election. That environment at Susquehanna helped me to question and to think for myself, to work out my own beliefs and learn that the public can be lied to. In 1969, the students at Susquehanna and across the country, with the support of the faculty, closed the school for what was known as the Vietnam Moratorium. Instead, we did teach-ins and community service. In 1970, I moved off campus and began withholding the telephone excise tax from my telephone bill. That tax was instituted to help pay for war and increased during the time of the Vietnam War. Ask me about that story sometime. And by the spring of 1971, many of us committed to civil disobedience in the May Day demonstrations in Washington, D.C. During a three-day period of trying to shut down Washington, D.C. in protest of the war, 13,000 of us were arrested. It stands as the largest mass arrests in this nation's history. I was held in a crowded 40-person cell with 120 other individuals for three days. 
I recognize this as one of the few times that I have truly risked something for what I believed. Words and beliefs are fine, but taking action, especially when there are consequences, means more. On an even more personal front, my student deferment from the draft ended and the lottery system was used to generate fodder for the war machine. As an opponent of the war, I was faced with the possibility of my own involvement. By then, I found it impossible to adhere to my conscience and yet serve in the military, so I filed for conscientious objective status. I did get the support from my Lutheran church, some of my former professors, and I thought made a good case for being classified as a conscientious objector. I was, however, bussed with many others for my physical, draft physical, before action was taken on my CO application. As it turns out, I failed the physical due to asthma, which fortunately has lessened as an adult. But during the draft physical, they also asked national security questions, specifically about organizations you've had been in contact with. As a member of the student government at Susquehanna, I had been involved in bringing Senate candidates to campus, including the candidate of the Socialist Workers' Party. That involvement resulted in hours of interrogation, fingerprinting, and a second day of questioning. Apparently, even candidates certified to run for office were a security risk. Of course, we've learned more recently that people elected to office can be a security risk. So I dodged the bullet, not the draft, and I didn't need to fire one. Thankfully, because I had no intention of serving in the war in Vietnam. I had wrestled with the possible decision of jail or Canada. I'm not sure which I would have chosen. My fraternity big brother at Susquehanna, whose father was a career military, went to Canada. This experience, this short era of my life, shaped me. In many ways, it set me on the path to Unitarian Universalism, because it taught me to think for myself and to obey my conscience. I still get angry at the damage this war has done to our nation. 55,000 young men and women killed for nothing. Nothing. My best friend in high school, whom I've seen as recently as this week, came back emotionally scarred. Now in his 70s, virtually everything in his life has been impacted by his war trauma. The so-called domino theory was a fabrication. We now trade with and even send tours to Vietnam, who prevailed in the war. All those lives for nothing. While I was unequivocally opposed to that war, and most of what our military has done since then, I now reject the definition of conscientious objector because it means opposition to all war. I'm not certain that there may not have been times when I would have served to free the victims of the Holocaust, for example. By making it an all or nothing definition, it strips the individual of the ability, I believe the right of conscience and the responsibility of a citizen, to determine for ourselves the justification for each military action. Before any citizen picks up a weapon, I believe they have the right to question the cause and doubt the government. No government should compel an individual to do something that is abhorrent to our individual beliefs, beliefs and our faith convictions. Before being put in a situation that could result in taking a life, we must retain the personal decision of conscience. Selective objection provides that. So as we mark this Memorial Day, I still mourn for all those who have given their lives for unnecessary causes, often on trumped up justifications. Manifest destiny. Remember the Maine, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, 
and the weapons of mass destruction. May those lost in all wars, and especially in such needless, trumped-up cases, may they rest in peace, and may we learn. Our reading today comes from the fantasy novel Night Watch by Sir Terry Pratchett. Alone, he went up to the cemetery of small gods. Commander Vimes strolled over the moss-grown gravel. In the twilight, the lilac blooms seemed to shine. Their scent hung in the air like fog. He waded through the grass and reached the grave of John Keel, where he sat on the headstone, taking care not to disturb the reeds. He had a feeling that the sergeant would understand that a copper sometimes needed to take the weight off his feet and he finished his cigar and stared into the sunset. There'll come a time when it'll all be clear, the monk said. A perfect moment. The occupants of these graves had died for something. In the sunset glow, in the rising of the moon, in the taste of the cigar, in the warmth that comes from sheer exhaustion, Commander Vimes saw it. History finds a way. The nature of events changed, but the nature of the dead had not. It had been a mean, shameful little fight that ended them, a fly-specked footnote of history, but they hadn't been mean or shameful men. They hadn't run, and they could have run with honor. They'd stayed, and he wondered if the path had seemed as clear to them then as it did to him now. They'd stayed not because they wanted to be heroes, but because they chose to think of it as their job, and it was in front of them. John Keel, Billy Wiglet, Horace Nancy Ball, Di Dickens, Cecil Snouty Clapman, Ned Coates, and Red Shoe. Probably there were no more than 20 people in the city now who knew all the names, because there were no statues, no monuments, nothing written down anywhere. You had to have been there. The night was welling up as the sun set. It unfolded from the shadows where it had hidden from the day and flowed and joined together. Vimes felt now in this strange, calm mood that he could hear everything, everything, just as he had done back in that terrible moment in Hero Street when history came to claim its own. He heard the tiny sounds in the stone wall as it cooled the faint movement of the long grass around the graves. A thousand subtle sounds added up to a richly textured, localized silence. It was the song of the dark, and in it, on the edge of detection, was a discord. Good evening, Your Grace, said Lord Vetinari. Commander Vimes spun around. There was a change of texture in the darkness, which could have been man-shaped. Vimes snatched up his sword and peered into the night. The shape came forward, became recognizable. How long were you there? Vimes demanded. Oh, some little while, said Lord Vetinari. Like you, I prefer to come alone and contemplate. They walked slowly down the gravel path, leaving the scent of lilac behind. Ahead was the everyday stink of the world. You know, said Lord Vetinari after a few moments, it has often crossed my mind that those men deserve a proper memorial of some sort. Oh yeah, said Vimes in a non-committal voice. In one of the main squares, perhaps. Yes, that would be a good idea. Perhaps a tableau in bronze, said Vimes. All seven of them raising the flag, perhaps. Bronze, yes, said Lord Vetinari. Really? And some sort of inspiring slogan, said Vimes. Yes, indeed, something like perhaps they did the job they had to do. No, said Vimes, coming to a halt under a lamp by the crypt entrance. How dare you, how dare you, at this time, in this place? They did the job they didn't have to do, and they died doing it, and you can't give them anything. Do you understand? They fought for those who'd been abandoned. They fought for one another, and they were betrayed. 
men like them always are. What good would a statue be? It'd just inspire new fools to believe they're going to be heroes. They wouldn't want that. Just let them be. Forever. Thus ends our reading. Now, read on. When does it start? There are very few starts. Oh, some things seem to be beginnings. The curtain goes up, the first pawn moves, the first shot is fired, probably at the first pawn, but that's not the start. The play, the game, the war, is just a little window on a ribbon of events that may extend back thousands of years. The point is, there's always something before. It's always a case of, now read on. Much human ingenuity has gone into finding the ultimate before. The current state of knowledge can be summarized thus. In the beginning, there was nothing, which exploded. Other theories about the ultimate start involve gods creating the universe out of the ribs, entrails, and testicles of their father. God's like a joke just as much as anyone else. Now, there are quite a lot of these stories, and they are interesting not for what they tell you about cosmology, but for what they say about people. Hey, kids, which part do you think they made your town out of? But this story starts on the Discworld, which travels through space on the back of four giant elephants, which stands on the shell of an enormous turtle and is not made of any bits of anyone's bodies. But when to begin? Now, these words that I've just read to you um, come from Sir Terry Pratchett, the famed Brit British fantasy author who captivated millions around the world with his prolific fantasy stories. His books have been translated into 37 different languages, and they've traversed just about every barrier between humanity that you can imagine. And Sir Terry's fantasy world, the disc world, is exactly where I want to start, because for him, and for me, the story is important. In his view, the truth is that we aren't actually homo sapiens, which rather vainly translates to wise man. We're actually Pan's Marins, the storytelling ape. It's our stories that make us human. You see, stories help us make meaning of our lives and in turn shape the reality of the world around us. Now, tomorrow is Memorial Day, a national holiday here in the States, a holiday that's been observed throughout our country since 1866. On Memorial Day, or at least the story goes, we remember and honor those who died defending our country and fighting for freedom and democracy. I think maybe the story has lost a bit of its luster in recent decades, though, since it's become more a day of barbecues and slip and slides than one of grave decorations and solemn remembrances. But if we happen to stop and think about it, maybe somewhere inside we feel just a little twinge of guilt that we aren't out on the sidewalks waving our flags as the band marches by. Because that's the patriotic thing to do, right? Whether we celebrate it or not, those of us who grew up in this country we reflexively know that Memorial Day is a day for honoring our country and the often faceless, nameless soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors who died in combat. As a Navy veteran myself, who worked with both satellite and drone imagery during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I have to admit that I sometimes think just a little bit too much about what kinds of stories we tell ourselves through these holidays revolving around war. Memorial Day, Veterans Day, 9-11. Memorial Day, as we now know it, officially got its start in the aftermath of the Civil War. Over 620,000 died in combat over just four years. One in four soldiers who went to war never returned home, and our country remained deeply divided even after peace was declared. Now, of those 620,000 war dead, the fatalities weren't split equally throughout society. In the South, plantation owners who owned, you know, 20 or more slaves 
Well, they were exempt from serving. And, you know, if a slave owner didn't own quite that many, he could always pay someone to take his place. In the North, the wealthy who were drafted, well, they merely had to purchase a substitute for no more than $300, as folks like J.P. Morgan, Grover Cleveland, and Andrew Carnegie did. In fact, James Mellon's father was able to get him out of serving in the Civil War by writing a letter where he argued, and I quote, there are plenty of lives less valuable. So naturally, in the end, when so many in the lower classes were reeling from their losses, our nation rallied together to recognize all of the war dead as patriotic heroes. Whether a soldier had lost his life fighting on behalf of the wealthy plantation owners of the South, or of the wealthy bankers and factory owners of the North, they were all heroes to be honored for their sacrifices. During my own service supporting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, most of my enlisted comrades and I, we were serving what is often referred to as the economic draft. We were poor whites, poor blacks, poor Hispanics, natives, and Pacific Islanders from every state and US territory around the world. For some of us, we never really closely interacted with an upper middle class person until our first interactions with the officers above us. And that was certainly the case for me. Um, I can distinctly remember the absolute panic I felt as a young 18 year old um, when I won an award at my first command and I got to have lunch with the Admiral. But eating across from the Admiral didn't scare me half as much as all of the silverware sitting before me. Silverware which each and every other person at that table seemed to know the right moment to use, and I was left fumbling in outright terror at being found out for the backwoods hillbilly I was. During my time in service, I never actually knew anyone who died in combat, despite many of my shipmates being sent boots on the ground, as we'd say. They were sent as individual augmentees to support the rest of our ground forces, who just couldn't keep pace in the violence of the occupation. Sure, they came back with deep-set eyes and haggard, sunken faces, rarely smiling. My one friend came home at the age of 22 with a never-healing hole in his lung and the need to walk with a cane. But for the most part, my shipmates came home whole. But a noticeable lack of casualties, on our side at least, has been an ongoing trend since Vietnam, when 55,000 drafted and enlisted servicemen lost their lives. In fact, the total combat-related fatalities suffered by American military forces in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001, they are barely more than the number of lives lost in the attacks on 9-11. In 20 years of war, we've managed to lose no more than a few thousand, 5,400, as a direct result of combat. And that should be a cause for celebration, right? But the truth is that we've shifted the risks of war to the civilians of those other countries. And we've done that with the use of drones, with smart bombs, with targeted killings. When I deployed to the Persian Gulf on the USS Enterprise, yes, I know, not that enterprise, though I may be a bit of a Trekkie at heart. When we deployed in 2006, I and my entire imagery team had recently been strike certified. We spent much of our deployment looking at satellite images of Iraqi townhouses. And then diligently calculating the distances, altitudes, and coordinates so that the so-called smart bombs could hit the supposedly intended target and hopefully not any of its many nearby neighbors. A year later, we got a new leader on board who insisted that I estimate how many bomb aim points I dropped so I could use it on my brag sheet and get promoted. When I refused to figure it out, he did it for me. It was in the hundreds. One dark night, years after I'd gotten out, I looked 
for the number of Iraqi civilian casualties during my first deployment. More than 6,400 innocent lives lost in the span of five months. By the time my six-year contract was up, I wanted no part of military service anymore. I got out, I moved to Coatesville, a small, impoverished, and very cheap to live in old steel town about an hour or so east of York. I started bartending in the tavern a few blocks from where I rented, a tavern where I was pretty frequently the only white person in the place. During my time there, my neighbors, my patrons and I, we became close. And it was during the arsons that lasted for nearly two years, with all of us racked with fear night after night. More and more, I started to see similarities between the destruction of my neighborhood there in Coatesville and the destruction that I helped cause in Iraq. The burnout husks of row homes in Coatesville kept bringing back this one memory, this one memory that I had from my time working with the Predator drones. It was this memory of a young Iraqi girl. She was in this, this frilly white dress. She was all alone. And she was searching through the rubble of a townhome similar to those around me. Back then, my Air Force comrades and I, we watched her in silence for what felt like ages. We watched her in our air-conditioned building 6,000 miles away while she struggled alone through the tragedy of her homeland. An uncomfortable, distant silence is sometimes the first step in recognizing that the story you're telling yourself doesn't fit. After nearly two years of police in Coatesville insisting that the gangs there were causing the deadly, life-altering fires, they finally began arresting the real perpetrators white outsiders who were connected with the fire department. The narrative our country tells us is that our military, our police, our firefighters are all heroes defending us, defending our country. The same narrative also implies that to question their actions, to question their motivations, or to be critical of the harms that they can cause is abhorrent, evil, unpatriotic. Earlier in our video reflection, political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal, a black Panther activist who remains behind bars in this very state to this very day, well, he laid out a vastly different narrative. The militarization of our society, it extends past the military. It extends to private military industrial contractors, to mercenaries, to arms dealers, to our very own police forces being trained by these same private mercenary forces. And our police forces being provided weapons, armored vehicles outfitted with machine guns, amphibious tanks, even grenade launchers. These armaments are provided secondhand to our police forces by the military as we funnel ever more of our communal resources into our own military stockpiles and into the stockpiles of other human rights abusing governments like the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia and the religious nationalist Likud-led government in Israel. We funnel our resources into militarizing our society, into militarizing our police, into building ever larger prisons even as violent crime rates plummet. All of this while we ignore and abandon cries for our own welfare for shelter, for food, for health care, for education, for a better life. This is not by accident. This is by design. In our reading earlier, I read a selection from the novel Night Watch about Commander Samuel Vimes and him coming to peace with the memory of those he'd lost in the glorious revolution of the 25th of May. And I couldn't help but remember this fantasy story 
last year on May 25th when George Floyd was murdered by the state. It was life imitating art, imitating life. In Sir Terry Pratchett's Discworld, Commander Vimes is transported back to one of the most tumultuous moments in his city's history. The city's leader is a paranoid megalomaniac. He sees plots and coups around every corner. So he enlists a special police force, the unmentionables, to rip people off the streets, imprison them, torture them, sometimes killing them. All of this to get at the imagined information about criminals and rebels and revolutionaries. On May 25th in the Discworld, when a group of unmentionables goes too far in a public street in the view of a crowd, widespread rioting breaks out all over the city. Watch houses are surrounded and attacked. They're attacked by everyday people who have reached their breaking point. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. once said, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice and humanity. It is undeniable that George Floyd was a victim of state violence, as were Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Ricardo Munez, Freddie Gray, Jorge Gomez, Jose Gutierrez, David McAtee, Dorian Murrell, Tamir Rice, Gabrielle Navarez, Patrick Underwood, Calvin Horton Jr., Rayshard Brooks, Daniel Prude, Akilah Jackson, Philando Castile, Tatiana Jefferson, Stefan Clark, Alton Sterling, Botham Jean, Michelle Cusseau, Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Janisha Fonville, Ora Rosser, Akai Gurley, Michael Brown, and 13-year-old Adam Toledo, who was murdered barely two months ago. All victims of state violence. As was Isaiah Christian Green, who was only 21 when he was murdered by Northern York County Police in 2017 for holding an AR-15 in his own home. As was Juan Bonilla, who was only 21 when he was shot by York City Police after dropping his weapon in 2012. As was Howard Thomas Cook, who was tased to death by York City Police for running from a car that had been pulled over for a traffic violation in 2011. As were countless nameless others killed in states, in cities, in towns across this country, across Iraq, across Afghanistan, across Vietnam. But like the people in the novel Night Watch all across this nation and across the world, we're waking up. Memorial Day, memorialization has always been dictated by those with power. Throughout history, those with power, those with wealth, with the printing presses, well, they've determined who and why and how to remember those who have fallen. Throughout history, the ruling class, who has always de declared the wars, as Eugene Debs once said, was also the one to declare that only the martyrs of the state are worthy of honor and remembrance. Now lost in that story are the victims of state violence. That story that we tell, that we buy into, it ignores the victims of our terroristic bombing campaigns in Iraq. It ignores the victims of state-sanctioned harassment in our streets at home. It ignores the victims of greedy healthcare profiteers and business owners when those working class people working under them are dying without adequate health care or without adequate protection in the midst of the pandemic. And it ignores the veterans dying by suicide after returning home and struggling to come to terms with their own moral injuries. When the uprisings for black lives began and when they continued and intensified in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, just as they did that day on May 25th on the Discworld, I began to see the glimmer of hope, the hope of a new story being told. A story where we no longer ignore or keep nameless the victims of oppression of state violence, of power, and greed. On the Discworld,
Commander Vimes once said, sometimes I dream that we could deal with the big crimes, that we could make a law for countries and not just for people. Here on our own round world, Unitarian minister Reverend Theodore Parker once said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one and my eye reaches but a little ways. I can calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, but from what I see, I'm sure it bends towards justice. The thing that in my view is missing from both of these is the power of the people. Perhaps the long arc of the moral universe is bending toward a kind of justice that also provides justice for the rest of us, not just to the needs of the wealthy or the state. Maybe, just maybe we are starting to tell ourselves the stories we need to hear to ensure that there are laws to handle the crimes committed by countries as much as the laws we use against everyday people trying to survive. The story matters. Our stories matter. When we remember, we must do so in a way that bends towards justice. Justice for the oppressed, for the forgotten, for the reviled, justice for all of us, justice beyond the moral posturing of the state or the status quo. Let us see past the narrative painted by the powerful. Let us paint a new story, a new path forward, a new moral reckoning for justice, for life, for survival, and for dignity for each of us. We come to that moment in our service when we ask you to make a financial contribution to our church. Your generosity helps to defray UUCY's operating expenses and also helps organizations in our community that are engaged in work that is in keeping with our Unitarian Universalist principles and values. Our Share the Plate partner during the month of, of May is Our Daily Bread. Our Daily Bread is a soup kitchen in York and a long-standing food justice project for our congregation. We have baked casseroles every other month for many, many years. Our Share the Plate contribution will help them with overhead and the purchase of other supplies. Greetings to all of you in the language of love, the universal language. Beauty is the splendor of truth. Use your hearts for what your hearts are for. Fill them with light. Do not fill them with darkness. The light of the human heart, when it's given faith, if it were opened up, it would blind the world. May this message give us eyes with which to see, ears with which to hear, and hearts with which to love each other and to love the world and to do good. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our closing words today come from Reverend William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign in the Moral Mondays movement. It is not enough, it is never enough, to just remember the evils of our past. For we know from our great teacher, Howard Zinn, that there are two narratives in this country and that we need to keep them both simultaneously in our minds and hearts. The first is the painful reality that genocide and slavery are central to our country's history. But there's always a second narrative, always a second remnant. And that is the crucial reality that our country has also been a country of powerful people's movements rising up against slavery and genocide with moral dissent and moral vision and moral resistance. So if we're serious about changing the present, 
We need to understand how that past came to be and how the legacies, both the legacies of genocide and slavery and the legacies of the movement against those evils remain with us today and why we must make sure that that legacy of resistance remains. There have always been two streams in America, one that wanted to go backwards and one that wanted to go forward. Which stream are you in? Because I still believe in higher ground, higher ground where we build schools and not walls, higher ground where we're more concerned about bread and butter than bombs and destruction, higher ground where we're more concerned about a guided culture than a guided missile, higher ground where we're more concerned about saving life and educating children than exploding communities, higher ground where we're more concerned about the treaties of peace than triggering war, higher ground there is higher ground where instead of finding more ways to kill and destroy and oppress one another, black and white and red and brown and Jewish and Asian and Muslim can form a beloved community. We must take this nation from the low ground and the graveyards of warmongering and war economy and profiteering and militarism to higher ground.